Good evening. I'm mild-mannered software engineer Matt Hackman, and I'm here tonight to deliver a very important public service announcement. Never use one of these, made for one of these, and plug it into one of these. If you or a loved one has been stupid enough to do this, the only fix is to make an entire YouTube series about fixing it. Welcome to Hacks Lab. So here we are at the bench and you're wondering, what the goddamn hell are you talking about? Let me tell you, a few months ago I went to Japan, I came back with a Famicom, I'm all excited. I figured, hey, Famicom is basically an NES, I'll just use my trusty first party NES Walt Ward. Got some nice AC adapter stuff going on here, getting some 9 volts out of it, it's going to be great. Plug it in, and there's a big pop, quick whiff of ozone. I'm freaking out. I unplug it and I'm like, okay, what the hell just went wrong? Well, let me tell you, this does not turn AC power into DC power. This, this is the exploded board from the Famicom, doesn't like AC power, it wants DC power. It's not doing any of the AC rectification on this board. Which you'd think that the the any the American version and the Jap Japanese version would do the same, but pfft, it's whatever. Interestingly enough, if you look at the American version, can you can you spot the difference? Can can you can you can you spot the differences between these two things? Yeah, it's the big fucking filter capacitor. They're doing AC rectification on the board here, and then they've got a big old fucking filter capacitor to get some beautiful DC out of it. I don't know, man. So whatever. I'm thinking I pumped my Famicom full of AC power and exploded it, but luckily I only exploded this, and that's kind of a blessing in disguise because the only video you can get out of the Famicom is RF. This is, we're talking like radio frequency. The, the signals you'd pick up over your rabbit ears, you have this adapter thing that you hooked into the back of your TV, it's, it's a mess. It doesn't work with modern televisions. So I was going to be doing a composite video mod anyways. And that brings us to the point of this project. We're going to make an entirely new board. I'm going to copy all the holes, you know, so I can, it's a drop-in replacement. We're going to take in some USB power, which is the voltage we already want, so I don't have to mess around with voltage stuff. And we're going to be getting rid of all this nonsense and getting nice, clean, composite video out. Let's go ahead and design that up. And for that, we're going to need my handy dandy notebook. So, a Famicom power and AV board. First thing a power board needs is, of course, power. And we're gonna get that from a USB port because that gives us a nice clean five volts, which is what the Famicom likes. We're going to also use the original switch from the Famicom so we can turn it on and off. And of course, we're going to get ground from USB as well. Coming down off of PPU pin 21 is the raw composite video signal, which we'll put into a little bit of a converter box just to clean it up. There'll be some capacitors and resistors and uh, maybe even a transistor in there of some sort. You know, some gnarly stuff. I can't take any credit for it because Nintendo came up with this for the second revision of the Famicom. Now that's going to go out to this nice little composite RCA jack at the bottom. And while we're here, we're going to get sound and we're going to duplicate the mono signal so we get something that's kind of like stereo, but not really. Oh, and because the Famicom doesn't have a light, let's add in uh, right here an LED. Uh, all right, this is this is looking like a pretty great schematic, but uh, it's not good enough for a board. So let's let's make a magic button, and that we're gonna press to make our PCB. All right, here we go. Now that we've magicked up a design, it's time to transfer it to the board. For that, we'll need the copper-clad board, of course, 
a scouring pad of some sort, something to clean the board with, I'm using cotton balls, isopropyl alcohol as the cleaning solution, and of course, the PCB design on transfer paper. First we'll rough up the copper a bit using the scouring pad. This will help the printer toner better adhere to the surface. Next we'll rub it down with some alcohol meant for rubbing. This will remove any contaminants such as finger oils or whatever that might prevent the toner from adhering to the copper. With the board prepped, it's time to align the printed design for transferring. Using a crappy iron and some random paper for heat diffusion, we essentially melt the toner off the transfer paper and onto the copper. A good eats wipe and about two minutes later and we can begin carefully peeling back the paper to reveal... Well that ain't right. No matter, with the help of our friend Acetone, we can pretend the past never happened and give it another shot. For the second go, I switched it up a bit by printing my design on wax paper, where I'd had success before. It's also nice to be able to see where the design is going to go as I place it. After that, same as before, apply lots of pressure and heat. Very gently peel back the wax paper and... I feel you, buddy. Well, you know what they say. Sometimes it's the third fourth, fifth, or even sixth time that's the charm. It's not perfect, but the traces are there and we can fix the rest. And fix it we shall, with the help of Mr. Sharpie to fill in all the gaps where the toner got peeled up. Unlike me, I recommend not coloring over holes that you actually need. For the traces, I'm using a finer tipped Sharpie and making sure everything connects correctly. There. Much better. And now, for some A, S, and R, as I put on my protective gloves so I don't etch my skin off. <clears throat> Enough of that bullshit, time to get our etching container out. I'm using this old deli meat container and our caustic buddy, ferric chloride. This is nasty shit, children, I recommend not drinking it. In goes our board to be etched. And just enough ferric chloride to cover. Jiggle it around a bit to make sure the copper is fully submerged and then slap the lid on top. Now comes the fun part where we rock the container back and forth, washing waves of fresh etchant over the copper. The hypnotic motion and waves conjures up images of the ocean like in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. The hypnotic rocking, saturated hues of sky and sea, and the soaring bars of Koji Kondo's score make you wonder why the sailing was so hated. Sometimes in life, it's the simplest things between the highs and the lows that bring real and true joy through contentment. Oh hey, it's done! We'll just dab this etchant off onto a shop towel. And using distilled water, we'll rinse the rest off into an old peanut butter jar that I've been repurposing for purposes of repurposing. Finally, we'll dry that off with a clean towel. Calling again upon the surfaces of acetone, the toner can be wiped off, leaving nothing but the shiny copper underneath. A quick scan to make sure the traces are good and we're ready for the next step. A shit ton of hole drilling. With the holes drilled, it's time to cut off the excess board. I suspect there's a better way of doing this, but I simply did a bunch of scoring with a box knife. Once sufficiently scored, I used some scrap wood to snap the board at the seam. Rinse and repeat for the other side. Using an old sanding block I had lying around, I sanded down the sides and edges that had gotten a little bit gnarly during the cutting. With all that finally done, it's time to test fit the board into the Famicom itself. And 
Now for the second half, populating the board with all our components. For that we'll need one composite video connector, a USB connector, I'm using type B, a 110 ohm resistor, some 150 ohm resistors, a PNP type transistor, a 1 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, a 220 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, and finally a red LED. There's really not much to say about soldering, so I'll just turn up the jazz. The space needs to be carved out of the case for the new connections. Using a pair of pliers, I removed the more egregious bits of plastic in the way. And then clean it up with a bit of Dremel work. What a wonderfully out of focus fit. With all the components now in their place, I next clean out the solder points on the Famicom for marrying the two boards together. And now more soldering as I run ground, power, sound, and video from the Famicom to our new board. Some more thumbs up and we're nearly done. The last part is to solder in the switch. And then put it all back together again. And so we come to the end of what was, for me at least, a rather long journey. Finally I get to play all my Famicom games in more glory than they were ever meant to be played in. Uh, I learned a whole bunch along the way, and with any luck, you got a little bit of entertainment value out of it as well. And if you have made it this far, well God bless ya. And thank you so much for watching, and a particular thanks to those people who I pestered while I was making all of this nonsense happen. Uh, tune in next time when I do something way less complicated. But until then, goodbye. This is farewell. There's graphics on my face. You can click on them, but I'd never ask you to do something like that. Because I'm not a beggar. I'm just a hack man. I'm singing a dumbass song. 
because I don't know how to close this video out. Da 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 da.